Okay, I think it's time to talk about some wireless technologies. We've covered Ethernet, we've covered a lot of the wired networks, so let's get and, and see what happens in a wireless network. So we're going to start off talking a brief reminder. We've already talked about network topologies um, in another video. A bus topology is a network where everybody is on the same network segment. And what being on a bus means, it means that no two devices anywhere on the network can be talking at the same time. Because one device, when it talks, it fills up the network with its traffic so nobody else can talk. It also means that everybody else on that network can hear every message that's being sent. So everybody on our network can hear the message that's being transmitted. Now, most of the time they're going to be ignoring it because it's not for them and computers have limited processing powers, but they can hear it if they want to and they can listen to it if they want to. A star pot topology, especially if we replace the hub here in the middle with a switch, a star topology separates everything out and, and has the benefits over a bus that there's, that every device can communicate with this central device and basically it's a single point of failure, but it's a single point of troubleshooting as well. The hub, every, all communication travels through the hub. So a wireless network, the reason I bring these two up, the reason I'm bringing up buses and, and star topologies is that a Wi-Fi network is very similar to both of them. It's sort of like a star. If you think about the way communication works in a wireless network, you have a star topology in a typical wireless network. You have a star topology where you have an access point and essentially everybody on the network is communicating through that access point. Even if they want to talk directly to each other, they're sending their traffic to the access point to then transmit that to the ultimate destination device. So in that way, it's like a star. It's also like a bus because everybody's sharing the same airwaves. And it's miraculous if you think about it. If you're in a busy room, if you're in an airport and you're connected to the airport Wi-Fi, or if you're in a classroom and you're connected to Wi-Fi in the classroom with 100 other students, only one device in that room is talking at a time. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's a, dang, it, it's a miracle that a hundred different devices can all take turns transmitting information to an access point, receiving information from an access point with only one device talking at the same time because it's a bus in that way that if one of you is talking, nobody else can be talking at the same time. So all of these devices are coordinating with each other. They're taking turns, allowing that communication to happen. And it's awesome. And most of the time it works so well, you don't even think about it. So recall again, brief reminder, CSMACD, Carrier Sense Multiple Access with Collision Detection, is what Ethernet does. You listen for collisions. You wait some amount of time if there is a collision. And then if, you know, if there is a collision, then you try to transmit again. What Wi-Fi does, it doesn't work on the same principles as Ethernet. It is CSMACA, Carrier Sense Multiple Access with Collision Avoidance. The difference is that collision avoidance. And the reason that we have collision avoidance as opposed to collision detection is that Wi-Fi devices can only send or receive. They can't do both at the same time. So these are half duplex devices. They can send and they can receive, but I can only do one of those at a time if I'm a Wi-Fi radio. So I can't detect collisions because if I'm transmitting, potentially creating a collision, I cannot at the same time be listening to know that there's a collision happening. So we use collision avoidance instead. And the way that we do that in, in Wi-Fi networks, one method for doing that is Basically, when you start transmitting, you announce to everybody how long you're going to be transmitting for. And that's only for a single frame. So you send one frame, and then you wait your turn again to talk on the network. And when you transmit, you tell everybody, I'm going to be talking for a couple microseconds here. So hold on. Nobody talk while I'm talking. And then you can pick up when I, left, when I stop. And then they all take turns that way. 
They do the same kind of listening that Ethernet does because they're doing the carrier sense multiple access. They're listening on the network first, but we can't do collision detection because we can't listen while we're transmitting if we decide to transmit. So on a Wi-Fi network, you may have seen, you may have seen these numbers before, these 900 megahertz, 2.4 gigahertz, and 5 gigahertz. These are the different bands. Now, the wireless radio communication spectrum, which is part of the overall electromagnetic spectrum, the big one, electromagnetic spectrum, includes gamma rays, microwaves, uh, light, visible light, x-rays, all those things things that you learned about in the high school physics class. All of those are part of the electromagnetic spectrum. A small part of that is radio waves, and that's what we can use for communication. And your walkie-talkies are gonna use that, your um, FM radio that in your car uses that, your AM radio in your car uses that. And these are different bands, different um, frequencies of communication inside of that radio section of the electromagnetic spectrum and the FCC in the United States and other countries licensing um, regulatory agencies have decided to license the small segments of that um, bandwidth all small segments of that spectrum and you can buy those for a, a little while back when there was the big conversion from analog transmissions of TV signals to digital transmissions of TV signals. The reason for that is because the digital signals take up a lot less of that spectrum, which allowed us to sell, well, allowed the FCC to auction off those previously analog TV sections of the spectrum, auction those off to other people. Well, so they license those slots of the electromagnetic spectrum, of the radio communication spectrum. But they've left a couple small chunks of that for free use. Now, 900 megahertz is one of those. Um, if you remember early wireless telephones, like landline telephones, those use 900 megahertz. Um, 2.4 gigahertz is another one. That one's pretty big and is used for a lot of things. In fact, it's used for so many things that it is extremely crowded. And so we're seeing now with wireless N and wireless AC, a push towards that five gigahertz band, which is higher frequency. And it's also less crowded because it's not full of other things like your microwave or your remote control cars and things like that. All of, all of those, basically most consumer electronics devices use one of these free unlicensed bands because it's free. And why would you not use something that's free unless you have very specific needs, um, high throughput needs and things like that. And, and, and then enough money to buy a chunk of that spectrum from the FCC or to license that from the FCC. So we're seeing 2.4 gigahertz. That's the earlier wireless technologies all the way up. N is compatible with 2.4 gigahertz um, and five gigahertz. So that's a dual band protocol wireless in, and then we're moving now towards five gigahertz. So the standards, there's a lot of 802.11 standards and, and you probably remember 802.3, which is the ethernet standard. And that's from the IEEE, which organization I do not remember, something about electrical and electronics engineers, I don't know, institution or something. But 802.11 is the standard for wireless communication, wireless ethernet. and 802.11a and 802.11b were out around the same time. And I remember both of them existing. Um, I never owned a device that operated on A, but 802.11a and B existed at the same time. You'll notice the A operated on 54 megabits per second and five gigahertz, while B operated at 11 megabits per second and 2.4 gigahertz. The biggest difference between A and B, besides the speed, um, which obviously A is the winner for speed, but the big difference is that B was cheaper. And in the early 2000s, when A and B were competing for people's attention, 11 megabits was plenty fast because your internet connection wasn't much faster than that. So 
As far as internet access, 802.11b was plenty fast. And while A was faster, it was also um, more expensive and more limited in range. So you didn't see very many devices using A. B kind of won. And then uh, the successor to B, G, 802.11G, gave us A quality speeds at, at, a, at a, that cheaper price point and, and better range than what A could offer at that 5 gigahertz band. Now, G was also backwards compatible with B. So a wireless G device could get onto an older wireless B network and connect. And a wireless B device could connect to a wireless G network and and communicate. So that was another advantage for that B-G combo. And then following G, we have N. That's kind of where we're at um, at this very moment when I'm recording this. 802.11N, and we're in the transition moving towards 802.11AC, where we're getting even faster speeds. And like I said, we're making that transition to the 5 gigahertz band just because of basically congestion on the 2.4 gigahertz band and higher higher bandwidth capabilities there so these bands even within that 2.4 gigahertz there's actually different channels of communication because of the way the radio communication works you can separate that out the band is wide enough to allow us to separate that into multiple other channels the important thing about these channels though is while we have you know, 1 through 11, and depending on what country you're in, you might see 12, 13, and 14 as well. Um, the important thing to note is that if your channel overlaps with other channels, then you might as well be on the same channel. And, and they're not strictly confined to one, to exactly, for example, channel 1 is 2.412 gigahertz. It's not exactly on 2.412 gigahertz all the time. Uh, attenuation, th going through walls, messes with that, and just changes in frequency, um, mess with that. So to make sure that the different channels don't interfere with each other, you, we've separated out, and basically while we have 11 channels, we really only have three that we can use. There's channel one, channel six, and channel 11. Because if you use channel three, notice the little purple arch there overlaps with channels one and six and if it's overlapping it's interfering if it's interfering then we might as well be on the same channel more or less and so really you only want to use channels one six and eleven if you're setting it manually now you could also set your radio antenna to automatically select the channel and i think most of them do a pretty good job of picking the channel that's least congested picking the channel that doesn't have as much traffic so here's a, um, an example of a Wi-Fi analyzer. Android has them available. I don't know that iOS devices have Wi-Fi analy analyzers um, capability. I don't know if Apple gives you access to the radio at that level. But here, um, I think this was pulled from my office. Looks like UNO Secure and UNO Guest are on channel one. Um, a few others are on channel six and nothing's on channel 11, at least when I took this screenshot. If I pulled it out now, it would probably show something on channel 11. But you can pull out an analyzer and see which channel is most open or least congested in your area, and you probably want to have your radio on that channel. So signal strength, it's measure, measured in decibel milliwatts, and, and this is important. Signal strength is important with wireless because if you have a weak signal, you know, you get the little one tiny bar in Wi-Fi, and you're not going to be able to communicate very effectively. It, it may have lower bandwidth, or really what's, what's happening is you're going to be losing a lot of information and dropping packets and, you know, communication essentially stops. So negative 10 decibel meters, milliwatts, sorry, decibel milliwatts, that's the maximum possible. This is basically if you're standing on top of a router that's transmitting at max power, you're probably never going to see that signal strength. Um, negative 67 decibel milliwatts is the minimum for reliable Wi-Fi. So if you have any lower than that, then you're getting that shaky signal where you're losing things and you might say you're connected, but you're not actually able to communicate on the network. And that's because you're below that threshold for minimum reliable Wi-Fi. And then finally, the negative 100 decibel milliwatts, that's basically you have no signal. So an important thing, um, I mentioned this word already, 
attenuation and and what attenuation is is basically signal loss because these signals have to go through stuff and that messes with the strength of the signal so going through drywall going through a cinder block wall going through a metal door going through a window all of these things well you don't really i mean obviously it happens you notice it when you move around a building but this attenuation this loss of signal from the radio having to go through stuff is important and it's important when you're planning your network to try to eliminate or, or avoid attenuation or at least take it into account in planning how many access points do you need where do you want those access points to be so that where your people are they're able to get the signal that they need so in wireless a very important thing about wireless communication is the antenna because the antenna is the sender and the receiver and there's a couple different options there's an omnidirectional antenna and this is basically what your access point does and probably what your laptop does in fact i'm sure it's what your laptop does as much as possible it sends signal in every direction because that way you don't have to turn your laptop to face the access point in order to send it and it basically like you see from the diagram here it basically projects that signal in all directions everywhere around it so the omnidirectional that's fantastic if you want to get a little bit better distance and, and in a specific direction, you can get what's called a directional antenna or a Yagi antenna. And what those do is they really focus the energy of, the, of both transmission and listening in a single direction, which allows you to get farther distance without projecting as much signal out in all directions. You're really focusing in front of you. And all of the signal is going in a single direction, which enhances your ability to listen in that direction and eliminates your ability to listen or, or transmit in any other direction in the omnidirectional bubble that we saw. So these are examples of directional antennas. Now, they look kind of weird. Um, the one at the top looks like a telescope. The one at the bottom looks like a rifle. And this is a directional antenna. In fact, this guy at the bottom put a scope on his directional antenna so that he could sight it in and know exactly where his directional antenna was pointed. And again, these focus that signal in a single direction to make you better at transmitting and listening in a single direction. You can build your own here with what's called a cantenna. And you could do it with a Pringles can, you could do it with a coffee can, and what this is really about is basically you put the antenna for the radio transmitter inside of a can and the can amplifies or, or collects a whole bunch of this radio signal that normally would have gone you know spread out all around and it amplifies and collects that and pushes it out in a single direction and focuses or and focuses it back if it's listening on the antenna which strengthens the signal and, and eliminates some of that loss or compensates for some of that loss and lets you listen from farther away. And you could use this if you have a compatible adapter, Wi-Fi adapter like this D-Link one. You can actually use this, drive around a neighborhood, point your antenna in all sorts of different directions and see what kind of signals you can get and how far away you can get with your signals. There's videos of people using antennas, and you can see them point, pointing them around in different directions and getting signals from even, even miles away. You can pick up signals with these types of directional antennas, which you wouldn't be able to get without a super, super high powered omnidirectional antenna. But by focusing that listening power and focusing, fo focusing the transmission, you're able to get that higher power and longer distance transmission. So here we go. The last thing we need to talk about with wireless at this point in this video is decision making. How do you decide if you want to have a wireless network or, or how do you decide if you want to have only a wireless network? Because a lot, you know, you think now that wireless is getting faster, we're getting wireless AC that has gigabits per second. Fantastic, awesome, it's almost, it's just as fast as our wired network. And it might be cheaper. We put in one access point or three access points. How much is that going to cost versus running cables and running wires and plugging things in? And wireless is nice because it's convenient. You can walk wherever you want, but there's drawbacks. 
So first of all, you need to think about cost. There's the cost of installing wires versus the cost of purchasing access points. Now you probably don't want to run down to Best Buy and pick up an access point, their cheapest D-Link for your business. Because as you probably experienced in your house, consumer grade networking equipment is often not that great. And it experiences a lot of failures that you don't see as often in enterprise grade stuff. And enterprise grade stuff also allows you other capabilities. Um, uh, we'll talk about some in security, but other sorts of management capabilities that allow you to coordinate your access points, if you have more than one, more effectively to make things work together a little bit easier. So you gotta think about cost, you gotta think about security, wireless networks, we'll talk in, a, in the next video about wireless security specifically, but wireless networks transmit everything all around you. So it can take, it, it can be secure, but you're still transmitting everything all around you and somebody might break in. Somebody might get access to your wireless network and it's a little bit easier to get access to a wireless network than it is to get access to a wired one. Uh, another thing is bandwidth. We, uh, we said AC is getting, getting there. It's about a gigabit per second. It's pretty darn close to the same speed as, all, as your common wire, wired networks today. However, keep in mind that that is a bus. And what that means is that all of your devices together share that network, which means that a gigabit per second network means a gigabit per second if you have one device on it. But if you have two or three or four or 10 or 30 people connecting to a wireless access point, you're gonna be sharing that bandwidth between all of them. Something to consider. And then reliability as well. A wired network rarely has the same problems that a wireless network does. However, wireless again offers all those benefits of convenience and speed and mobility. All of those things are fantastic. And that's all, that's all for the intro to wireless that we're talking about here. We'll talk in the next one more specifically about security.